Okay, we, we attempted to put together a little um, memorabilia for you after we finished. Perhaps you can have a look over there. And something like this ad would have been something that the cat would have thought of say, Jump in the line, it's holiday time. It's gay, truly native. Better not say it's gay today. <laughs> the cat and the fiddle, showtime, 10.30 and 12.30. Featuring Sweet Richard, the cool one. See the authentic Gombe dancers and the fire dancers starring Freddie Munnings, the Gombe king in person. Truly a great show. One of the highlights of your vacation. Non-stop music, calypso, cha-cha, merengue. Come early. <laughs> okay, that's just a, one of the ads that would have been in some of those books in the old days. Also, we tried to show um, Freddie Munnings some of his albums, some, some of his record covers. So, as I say later on, you can see those over there. And just before we go to um, Freddie Munnings, I'd just like to read something into your hearing from Mr. Eric Cash. And Eric Cash was daddy's music teacher when he taught him in, in the Bahamas before he went away to school to further his music education. He said, I speak about the foundational part of Freddie Munnings. I first got close to Freddie in the mid-1930s. Both of us played the trumpet then. At that time, he was living in Hay Street East. He came to me one day saying that he, that he didn't want to practice at home because he didn't want to make noise in his mother's ears. I told him that he and I could practice at my house. My mother wouldn't mind. We played trumpet in the Catholic band. Afterwards, we played in the Baines Orchestra um, under the direction of the late W.A.G. Bain. This orchestra became Rudy's Orchestra. The leader was the late Rudy Williams. Um, this, ri this, this writing, the words and music in my mind, I could hear Freddie saying it. Incidentally, he has recorded the song Nassau, Nassau. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I turned it on the page. This same group eventually became Freddie Munning's orchestra. By this time, about 1943, both Freddie and I switched to the tenor saxophone and the clarinet. Freddie um, co concentrated mainly on the clarinet. He also sang all the favorite songs. Although Freddie was naturally gifted and talented, he wasn't satisfied until he got some formal musical education. He and I, being like brothers, he asked me to help him. I went to his house on Collins Avenue three times a week and spent time in a quiet room doing the theory of music and iron out any practical difficulty encountered in reading and or interpreting music for clarinet or voice. We did this for a length of time until Freddie was successful in passing the higher local Trinity College of Music London examination. Freddie had also done some studies in the USA. I think it was at the Boston Conservatory. Now to be considered famous, one had to sing or play like a famous American recording artist whom the world admired. In these days, probably the most renowned American singers were Bing Crosby and Perry Como. Freddie sounded like Perry Como. I practically like to hear Freddie sing ballads. I, I'm sorry, I particularly like to hear Freddie sing ballads. Back in the late 1950s, I composed a song. While I was writing the words and music in my mind, I could hear Freddie singing it. Incidentally, he has recorded that song, Nassau, Nassau. Freddie Munnings was a great entertainer. I suppose someone else will speak about entrepreneurship. How um, he operated nightclubs, organized floor shows, and brought in um, musicians and entertainers from the islands of the Caribbean Sea and from North America. By entertaining Bahamians and tourists, many tourists came here asking for Freddie Munnings. Freddie um, rendered a great service to his country, the Bahamas, and that's signed Eric B. Cash. So I just want you to hear that. <laughs> we'll ask um, Freddie Munnings Jr. now to give his um, rendition of, or recount of, of Freddie Money's life, after which we'll have Vera Chase come to her poem. Good evening, everyone. I am pleased and honored to have been asked by Andrea to be a part of this panel this evening. Of course, I see any number of persons out there who could have probably addressed my father's life from the perspective of his activism. I wondered why they would ask me to do this. 
I don't know that I, I may be falling in his footsteps along those lines. I would much prefer to follow in his footsteps as a musician and entertainer. But his philosophy, whenever you see wrong, you must try to make it right. And that's what I'll try to share with you this evening. Frederick Alfred Munnings, senior musician, entertainer, businessman, civil rights leader, trade union leader, humanitarian, Bahamian patriot, social and cultural activist. To set the mood for this part of our, our presentation, I would like to draw from the work of Sir Randall Fox, The Faith That Moved the Mountain. In an excerpt in his book, he wrote, on May 24th, 1930, the British Empire Day, the King of England visited the Bahamas and he made this address. The King addressed the Caucasian students of Queen's College during his visit and encouraged them to study hard to show themselves worthy of becoming the rulers of the land. When he addressed the black children on Eastern Senior School's sports field on Shirley Street on May 24, 1930, he admonished them, you must work hard, for only in this way can you become good maids and laborers in the future Bahamas. Fox went on to say that his parents had a petty shop and in his words, a conky Joe or white Bahamian sold ice about 100 yards down the road from their shop. One of their regular customers transferred his business to the white Bahamian store. And one day, Mrs. Fox asked the former customer, why are you purchasing your ice from another shop? Well, ma'am said, Gentlemen, you see, it's like this. The white man's ice is a little colder than the black man's ice. A popular saying of the day was, if you're white, you're just all right. If you're brown, you can stick around. If you're black, you stay in the back. Those were the days, the 1930s. I move now quickly to 1942, which is historic in our country, known to many of us as the Burma Road Riot Year. And the setting was that an American, during the Americans' entry into World War II in Europe, in the Far East, created a shortage of manpower in its farms, and therefore, May 27, 1942, the Duke flew to Washington to negotiate with President Roosevelt the recruitment of Bahamian farm laborers to arrange for further involvement of the Bahamas in the total war effort. The United States and the United Kingdom governments decided to build an airport at Oaks Field in New Providence. Without any kind of prior consultation, with any of the representatives of Bahamian labor, the two contracting powers fixed the wages for Bahamian workers at four shillings. Those of you who don't know, like Jill and them, that was one dollar per day. Upon the announcement of the new project, workers from all over the Outer Islands flocked to Nassau to seek employment. Among them came exhumians, with a report that the American government had previously employed them in similar construction work and paid eight shillings or two dollars a day. On hearing this, their fellow Bahamians in Nassau concluded that their employers were handing them a squeezed lemon. Long story short, there was a massive upraise, uprising and it ended up in something you now know as the Burma Road Riot, 1942. Moving very quickly because I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> in 1958, there was a general strike. But before that, the Citizens Committee, of which Andrea spoke, 
Dr. Cleveland Ilias, Dr. C.R. Walker, Maxwell Thompson, Rodriguez, many others, including featuring Sydney Poitier. It's going to be played. And Sydney Poitier in this movie was playing a doctor, I believe, someone of integrity. And the proprietors of the movie. And so this group, led by my father and others, protested. And eventually the movie was played. There were two other movies. I can't remember their names, but there were three movies in all. But eventually all of the movies were played. And so this was the spirit of Freddie Munnings, where he saw wrong, choose to make it right. He once told me a story about the late Stafford Stans. He said, one morning, after having a very successful rally and fundraiser at the Captain Phil for the Progressive Liberal Party, Sir Stafford Sands called him and said, Freddie, what did you do with the money you made last night? I know you didn't put it in the bank because I checked your bank account. He said, I put it in a hole over the hill. And he said, Freddie, I want you to discontinue being involved with this political thing. You are a wealthy man, you are a great entertainer. Why are you getting involved with politics? He said, he told Stafford Sands at the time, he said, my mother, who's a black woman, cannot go into this void here. I'm going to change that. And Stafford Sands told him, what were you there, audio? In 1963, when Sidney Poitier won the Oscar Award for the first time, a black man having won an Oscar in the United States of America, he said he suggested to the Speaker of the House then, Robert Simonette to put the face of Sidney Poitier on the stamp to bring some honor to him and show Bahamians how proud we were of this Bahamian having achieved such a wonderful accomplishment. And Bobby too said to him, Freddie, you're dreaming, man. That would never happen in this country. Over my dead body, he said, your daddy couldn't do it, your mother couldn't do it, and you or no one else will do it. We reign supreme. And he said, Bobby, you will live long enough to see us change that. They were friends. They were having a gentleman conversation. That was the climate of the Bahamas from a activism perspective of Freddie Money Sr. As you have already heard, he was a member of Kohanas. And he was a founding member of the Bahamas Musicians and Entertainers Union that fought for the rights of musicians in our country. And as Duke has already told you, he was a renowned musician, but they could not go into the respective places because of the color of your skin, but for to play music. And when you would have finished your music, you would have to leave those premises. And he told me he made a vow never to play in those places. We didn't have to. He was going to own his own club, and so he did, as you will hear shortly. But the bottom line is this. Where he saw wrong, he did what he could to right it. And so he got involved, and he led many, many demonstrations for the rights of Bahamians, particularly in the field of music and entertainment. And I'll tell you a couple of stories to demonstrate his commitment to that. When my brother, Raphael, recorded Funky Nasa, and I'm sure he'll talk more about this, but I vividly remember this. He was booked to do a tour in the United States of America with Marvin Gaye. It was a 26 city tour. And when the American Federation of Musicians heard about this, they refused to allow Raphael and the band to be the opening act for Marvin Gaye because they felt that there were many, many American acts who were capable of being the opening act for Marvin Gaye and they did not allow Raphael and his group, including my other two brothers, Leroy and Frank Bud Munnings, to go on tour. Well, my father didn't take too keen to that and he called up the American Federation musicians along with the musicians executives and they ended up with an agreement 
But prior to that, he spoke with his good friend, Clifford Darling. Sir Clifford Darling, we now know him as the former Minister of Labour. And Sir Clifford Darling said, he told him to, Freddie, bring me my pen. Of course, you know, he embellished the story very dramatically all of the time. <laughs> and Sir Clifford took a position that if no Bahamian could go into America, no Americans would come into the Bahamas. I think we need more men like Sir Clifford Darling in the country today. But he protected the rights of Bahamians. And so Tibor Rudas and the like, who brought in all the foreign acts, had to acquiesce. And there was a cultural exchange between the two countries eventually, which allowed our artists to go into the United States and perform to much success. I know Rafael and I did many trips. Uh, we went to Vegas, we also went to New, uh, New Orleans, we went to Atlantic City, and many, many others participated in this cultural exchange because men like Freddie Munnings and Sir Clifford and others took a stand that this country belongs to the Bahamians and we must be first in our country. That was his mantra. Uh, the current political parties who has that mantra now but it from men like him and like C.R. Walker who built a hotel because his black friends from America, his wife was American, could not go into the hotel so he built a hotel called the Reinhardt Hotel right there on New Hill Road. It still stands today and I believe it should become a museum so that we can remember. When I walked in here and I looked at all the artifacts and I reflected and I look up and I see the history of this country. Where is the history of us as Bahamians? We must preserve our culture so that our children and our grandchildren could understand who we are. The late Frederick Douglass once said, if you do not learn the lessons of the past, you will continue to repeat the class. I call for us to write our history. And let me end with this. 1962 or thereabouts, I believe, and Sean is here, so I want to stand correct on my dates. I believe the year when Ghana got its independence, he built a nightclub called the Ghana Room to commemorate Africa's independence. And I am told that he brought artifacts from Africa to decorate that room. And that was the Freddie Money Senior of whom I speak. And he will continue to live, because you can hear, at least in this money's, that passion still lives. And all the money's, Andrea, President of the Historical Society in Lana, Raphael, and all my brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews and nieces will continue to live because Freddie Money's lives in us. And I guarantee you that one day and one day very soon his story will be told because we are going to tell it. He told me, he said, Freddie, you cannot say some of the things I say to you until 20 years I death. This month makes 20 years after his death. So I will begin to tell that story as I know it because I believe it is worth telling. I believe it's important for us to tell the truth. As ugly as the truth may be sometimes, it's important for us to tell the truth. And so lives the life, the times of Freddie Manning Sr. Thank you.